Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Autistic Tidbits and Tangents podcast. Today, we have a guest with us, Bruce, and we are going to be talking about late diagnosis. So we're going to be diving into kind of what are the benefits of late diagnosis, why even get a diagnosis later in life, and like kind of getting ready for your assessment and whatever else we think of. So get ready for some tangents. And as always. Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. <laughs> cool. Potential trigger warnings for this episode include discussions of ableism and prejudice against autistic people, as well as um, brief mentions of prejudice against neurotypical people. All right, so I want to introduce my friend, Bruce Petherick. Bruce is a composer. He is an autistic teacher. Uh, he has many things. I will actually let him introduce himself, tell a little bit about his background, and then we will deep dive into the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I do hate talking about myself sometimes. So this is a little, one gets embarrassed at the start, and then I'll get into it. Um, so. As Kara said, my name is Bruce Petherick. Um, I'm originally from Melbourne, Australia, and now happily live in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I was diagnosed a number of years ago. I can't just, I was gonna look it up, but in my early fifties, um, uh, I had guessed for a little while and for various reasons, went through the diagnosis process. Um, also, as Kara said, I have been a professional musician since I was way too young, like 16, um, and have just had a slight career change in the last couple of months where I now work. Uh, my job is to work with Autism Canada, where I am. I work with the family services team and I am the, the autistic advocate for the organization. Um, <laughs> that I will not be the yeah, well, um, advocate after a, short, after a little short period. We need to get more people. So there you go. Um, wow. So Bruce, you, you were fundamental in me getting my diagnosis, my diagnostic discovery, although it was something I had wondered about for years. Um, so question for you um you you we we connected because you read my book and you reached out to me and we started just having really professional conversations about all things autistic teaching and um and you sort of slowly started sending me articles and going okay what what's what's your feedback on this and is that a professional response or an intuitive response <laughs> as you kind of <laughs> directed me towards so I have a, so what were some of the things that you noticed in me that, that uh, made you think I was a kindred spirit in that sense? What an interesting question. <laughs> we do what we can here at Autistic Kid Business. Yeah. <laughs> to, to be honest, I'm not too sure I can articulate specifics. I think there's a comfortable feeling when I meet another neurodiverse person mm -hmm. and often there's an intellectual going through the list after the fact mm -hmm. um and I, I actually uh, trying not to share too much privacy but I spent a week with Kara doing we were doing some work um uh, wow, almost a year ago now and I think observing your home life was the big 100%. And it, it was just the, um, the routine, the um, being, getting very deep into something and not being aware of some things going past. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also the fact that you and I could parallel play Yes. which in, in, in the way we were doing, it was just sitting in the big living room, just reading. And, and, and 
being completely con uh, comfortable about that you, you that doesn't happen with neurotypical people okay. uh, they they would get antsy and like you and i were just quite happy just to sit in a room reading and sometimes talking but like not interacting in a way yeah. that i think would be neurotypical and like mm -hmm. we established very quickly too like if you need a break just go to your room like there's we're not going to make demands on each other socially mm -hmm. um in that way and 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 you actually helped me like there was there was a revelation when we were on the the metro system the subway system um and you said do you want to try my noise canceling headphones and I had never, I'd never tried them because I don't, I'm, I'm wearing headphones now, but I hate it. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I hate anything on my ears. <laughs> um, and you, you, you handed them over to me and I put it on and just like this immediate sense of peace. And I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, I've always felt like impatient and I don't know, um, I don't want to use a swear word, but I, I've always felt uh, a little agitated on the TTC and I wasn't really, aware. that's the Toronto Transit Commission. And I wasn't aware of it until I put those on and mm -hmm. just felt this visceral calm that I'm not used to having in that setting. <laughs> it is a weird feeling the first time you put noise canceling headphones on. It's, it's like all of a sudden, all of that noise is, well, it's not gone, but it's less. And, and it's like, oh, wow. Can the world be this quiet? That's amazing. And it reminds okay. me of like when I go swimming, I, like I sometimes just like to lie with my ears covered and it's the same sort mm -hmm. of, and it's just like. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, when, I, when I first put my uh, noise canceling headphones on in public, it was completely fine. It was, and it was for shopping. And it, it was great because I could still hear, I was shopping with my wife and, mm -hmm. and I could still hear her speak and I was still aware of things. So it's, it wasn't like you're completely isolated. And then as we walked out to the car, I took them off and I realized how loud the world was. And that was, yes. and, and again, intellectually, I, I know this. I, I've actually spent some time in an anechoic chamber. Um, I, I'm an academic musician. There's basically nothing I haven't done when it comes to sort of music things. And so uh, I had a friend uh, at the University of Queensland that he had access to an anechoic chamber. And of course, of course, you go in and you play an instrument or you sing and something. And it's, that's freaky. That's really, really weird. So I know it, what is, the world is. Is that the type of chamber that completely silences everything? Yes, and what you're aware is there's no such thing as complete silence because okay. um, there's a famous story of uh, the composer John Cage who went into one in, the, uh, I think it was the 50s, and uh, said to the engineer, look, I can still hear two, I can hear sounds, I can do a really, really high sound, a really low sound. He said, oh, yeah, that's your, that's actually your body, that's your nervous system and, your, and the blood pumping through your body. Wow. That's amazing. Ooh. And weird. it's, it's weird. Um, and that pushed Cage into the idea of his famous piece, 4 minutes 33, pointing out that there is no such thing as silence. There is no such thing as total absence of sound. Even in space, although we talk about it's a pure vacuum, there are still sound vibrations. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Tangent. You know. <laughs> And, 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 you know, we have this tiny, tiny bit of in this huge galaxy. That's just us. Yeah. Anyway. Um, what? It, okay. Getting back on our topic. So your late diagnosis, um, I'd love to hear a bit about that. Like what were some of the things that led you to get a diagnosis? Um, and what were your thoughts and feelings around it? Easy question. And a kind of little, now it's almost become cliche. Uh, it's Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, for the first couple of years of us being together, we would fall asleep or she would fall asleep watching Big Bang Theory. It's a show I mm -hmm. hadn't seen before. And it's, it's now, um, it's now the background, um, you know, people read cheap novels. We work cheap fiction, um, uh, on holiday. We watch Big Bang Theory to go to, go to sleep to. Um, and I suddenly started thinking, oh, boy, no, Sheldon certainly there's so many characteristics about me <laughs> and then seeing how 
recognizing it's a cliche drama series or a comedy series it's like the way other people reacted to him I thought oh hang on people have been reacting to me like that all my life and I think the one that sealed um, it for me is if you don't know the show there's an episode where Sheldon is so paying a focus to a problem he has that they're at the restaurant and he suddenly looks up and and he looks at everybody and goes like when did we get to the cheesecake factory in other words he had they'd been doing this for like an hour and he mm. did not realize so I went uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> that then led me to um a number of books the I think Neuro Tribes was the one that really was was yeah. very influential. And I, I love Neuro Type Tribes because one that talks about neurodiversity in total, not just autism, not just ADHD, but a whole bunch of things. But it's such a it's such a positive book mm-hmm. about um how neurodiverse people can be accepted mm-hmm. and yet talking about how, how it's not anyway. So reading books it, and then of course it is a marvelous book. It is. Yeah. And and I'm surprised how old it is now in yeah. in, in a way. Yeah. I, I but it's also you can't do another version of it. There's nothing no. that it's it's a wonderful slice of time. Yeah. Anyway, I then went a deep dive and basically started reading a whole bunch of a whole bunch of books and you know, a very autistic tray, right? Yep. Um <laughs> you get a new subject and you um I think, Kara, you sent me a text about this yesterday. Yes, I did. Just do a deep dive. Um, so, and then it was like, okay, I'm doing some tests, doing some online tests. I thought, okay, feels like I'm autistic. But it, that, I didn't need to take any further until my wife, who at the time uh, was a social worker, and she's just she's also going through a slight career change at the moment um and she was starting to get frustrated with she said I don't want to bring my work home and I feel I'm, I'm having to work work with you as well and it, that just confused me because like I I don't understand what's what's um mm. what's going on I don't understand what the what the bringing the work is because you know what I don't need a social worker so mm. I then said, look, we talked about that together and um, thought, well, why don't you go get a diagnosis? And we had a, a therapist who'd been working with our kids for various reasons prior to me. And um, we talked to her and she said, oh, I'm, I, can do an, I can do an adult diagnosis. I'm, I'm certified in that. So I went, okay, let's do it. And I have to say, and my, uh, I know the system is the same around the world, but getting a diagnosis is the most horrifically complex thing. And um, the fortunate thing for me was that we had private health insurance mm-hmm. and, and that Meredith's um, work cover allowed us a certain amount of money for psychological um, services. So it was like, it, it, it wasn't a financial burden if we didn't have it, I wouldn't have done it, which mm-hmm. is really kind of funny. Anyway, did the did the um, did the 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 diagnosis with the psycho psychologist and um, got a positive level one diagnosis. Um, I must admit, and this may be a tangent, um, the week before getting the final final diagnosis was horrible because yeah. i was going through the what happens if i i'm, I'm not autistic am i just a jerk mm, yeah. you know um <laughs> like what, yeah, yeah like it, you are you're this, not <laughs> the the self-doubt and the imposter syndrome of like i'm identifying with this thing but what if it's not really yeah. true yeah and, and Where does that I, leave me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I um, f- had ever felt imposter syndrome before. Mm-hmm. Uh, although now in thinking back, and again, that'll, that's for later. Um, but it was, it, was, it was terrible. And as I worked in the office, I was, um, I was really super anxious for the, mm-hmm. the final. And, and the psychologist said, 
Look, just to make you make you feel comfortable right now, you are autistic. And I just went, ah. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's silly. It was such a relief. Um, no, but it, it is that validation, isn't it? To, to know that I'm, I'm right about this thing. It, it's not just me. It really is true. And I don't just feel this way. I am yeah. this way. Yeah. Mm. yeah and, mm. and, and it's okay. I, the, the doubts that I've been having, I can put those away now, at least for now, because yeah. imposter syndrome has a way of popping back up, oh, doesn't it? And, it, it and, and again, right, I can talk about it a little bit later. Um, I have to say that a lot of that validation took was second place because the most important thing is my wife then said, I now have a box to put you in and, and talking completely professionally. So, so mm. as a social worker, she went, okay, you're autistic. So if you do this, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're, you know, you're angry with me or I've done something wrong. This is part of your autism and it wasn't perfect, but it actually helped her. Having a framework. Yeah. That makes sense. And then I had the, the up and down roller coaster after yeah. that, a year after that. Wow. So that's the process for me. It was, it was a, um, other than the, the day or two before actually having to go back to get the final um, diagnosis results, it was a pretty positive, actually, it was a very positive experience, um, including things like there was a, question in the iq apps part of the of the question mm -hmm. of the diagnosis there was a multi-step mathematical problem that when i got home i worked that i had made a mistake in step one and i wanted to ring and say i've got uh, sorry I, I made a mistake in step one can i change my answer uh relatable yeah, we, <laughs> what about about you maya so you you got your diagnosis as a teenager yeah I was um, what was that like um, it was, I mean, what I remember of it, um, it was, it was mostly annoying. Um, so my, my mother hadn't told me why I was going to these people. Um, Ooh. I didn't know why I was there or what we were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they were giving me all these tests. And of course the, the intelligence test part of it is, is different for children and adults. And unfortunately, the, the, the children's test involves some questions and some, some tasks that are, they can feel a little bit infantilizing when you are a teenager. Yes. It's a terrible and age to take the test. It, it is. Well, I mean, I was a little bit younger, um, but for me, it actually took like three, three and a half years to get the diagnosis because at the time it was a boy's diagnosis. Mm. Um, and Denmark is always a little bit behind on the curve. So certainly in, in other parts of the world, women were getting diagnosed and, and, and things, but in Denmark at the time, it was still very much a boy's diagnosis. So they were very skeptical that it was even a possibility that I could get an Asperger's diagnosis. Um, but yeah, I mostly, I mostly remember feeling infantilized and kind of annoyed. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I remember was having to do uh, a labyrinth and okay. So some people are, is this, some autistic people really stick to the rules and some autistic people find weird ways of solving problems that aren't necessarily correct, but they work. Right. Um, so as a child, I started doing labyrinths the, the wrong way around. So I would start in the middle and find my way out. How else would you do it? Right. That's the most efficient way of solving it's it. It's the most. Amazed. <laughs> it is. Because there has to be one way and that's the way to, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but like, no, but, yeah, but okay. that's exactly that's exactly my way of thinking. And so I started doing it the way I had already always done it. And the psychologist interrupted me and was like, no, you have to do it the right way. And and I just felt like, oh, come on. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> like, so I just I just remember feeling annoyed at these 
adult women who didn't understand me and they were making me do all of these stupid things a stupid way <laughs> yeah and then um then it was actually my mother who told me the results uh so she was the one to tell me I was autistic they had told her I I was not told directly so I got the message from her and the explanation of what autism was from her and then after that it took me it took me a good four or five years before I was ready to hear anything else about autism from that point on um because I just felt like okay it, it's called something fine whatever <laughs> I was just done and then of course well here I am <laughs> I have a thousand questions right now, Carol. Do you mind if I ask some questions? I don't mind sure, at all. Go ahead. Cool. Um, one's kind of personal, and I, so I'll ask you that one first. And if you don't want to answer, please. Oh, that's that's fine. Go ahead. Why did your mother not tell you what you were doing? Uh, I I don't know. Um, I, I if I was to speculate, I think she didn't want to tell me that she suspected um that it, it, the way she would phrase it was that there was something wrong with me um and i i don't think she wanted to say until she was sure interesting um, yeah um but i I, th I think that was why and and honestly here's the thing it is possible it is quite possible that at some point someone told me very quickly what we were doing and it just didn't stick because as it turns out, I also have raging ADD and that was not diagnosed until I was 33. Wow. <laughs> so a lot of my memory from growing up is very fragmented because the things I pay attention to, I pay attention to very closely and everything else is just a blur. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a complete blur. And so there's a lot of information that gets lost, mm -hmm. but I don't remember ever understanding what I was doing there. Yeah, that's that's sad. Um, and the, the second question actually is tied into that one. Um, is it still the case that a 16 year old would not be told personally by the psychologist or the person making the diagnosis? And is there still a skew? a masculine feminine, feminine skew in Denmark when it comes to diagnosis, do you think? Um, there, there is, but it's, it's not as much of a, a skew as it used mm -hmm. to be. Um, and certainly when we look at adult populations, that the skew is much smaller. Um, but it, it is a thing that boys tend to be um, spotted earlier. Um, I definitely think that most professionals at this point in time would encourage parents to have their child be present when the diagnosis is, is delivered and explained, um, or at least to have them involved in it. But until you're 18, the parents make the choice. Um, so... It, it's interesting because I, I, I know yeah. in Canada, it's not a law. No, it, but, it's, that's the thing. It's not the law, but yeah. it, would the the mm -hmm. it would yeah. be the norm. It would be the norm. We would It's kind of interesting. I, I, think the, uh, I think the opposite is here, is that the norm would be um, 16 year old would, would, would mm -hmm. do it. And so, so in fact, let me, let me just talk about my, my, my daughter has, mm. GAD and ADHD, ADHD mm -hmm. and GAD. Um, her uh, pediatrician told us two two years ago or a year ago, she, he said that he would feel much more comfortable if Sky went by herself to the office, so mm -hmm. that she didn't have us in the office, so she could be completely free with yeah. him. So great, cool. So since she's been fifteen. The pediatrician still will call us into the office, but she goes in by herself, and yeah. it's like that's uh, that's completely fine. I'm actually the story about the you know girls not being diagnosed as boys, like that's an old story and it's horrifying. But it's like I've been horrified for that for like ten years. Mm. The not being told 
is like, especially at 16, I mean, we're not talking like a 10 year old, we're not talking no. like a four year old, but 16, you, that's, that's amazing that yeah, you I, didn't I, get I the think, diagnosis yourself. I just think 20 years ago, things were different. Um, so I, I think, I think that was it really. And mm. I mean, today, I would certainly expect that any child that's over 12 or 14 yeah. would be told directly by the psychologist or psychiatrist, probably with their parents present, uh, but not necessarily even. Um, but, but there would be a conversation with the parents probably about, this is how we are considering doing it. What do you think? Um, I, I so, find yeah. it unfathomable because, I mean, I don't think you necessarily have to say to a young child, we're considering autism or ADHD, but I, I would imagine, mm -hmm. or I would like to think that psychologists or any of the diagnosticians are saying things like, we're figuring out how your brain learns best. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that kind of approach, so at least they know yeah. the gist of, of why they're, why they're there. <laughs> but those are also such vague statements that a child might, might not, not it might not understand or might not remember that they've been told that so again like it's possible that somebody said something to you <laughs> but i certainly did not pick it up <laughs> okay. um, Actually, i think it's interesting but car and i are very um happy to be public car mm -hmm. very recently but still and and i think from what from our teaching perspective we have always been we need to make sure the kids know that they are autistic, ADHD, neurodivergent, yeah. because it's it's giving them agency. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of interesting. I think that's maybe a a personality trait of both of us. That kind of it, it, you know, we're so horrified that you weren't given that chance at an age which I think fundamentally everyone, almost everybody, would say yeah. you're old enough to understand or know. You would think, but I yeah. I, I think it's also very much um, an autistic thing that so autistic adults i think have a sense of justice for for the children who are going through these processes yes. or or who are a bit different and we want to show them look there are there are adults that are different too we've we've yeah. gone through this <laughs> and you're not alone and it's okay and we want to hold your hand as you're going through it or if you don't want to hold hands then at least we'll walk beside you like we're on this journey and, and it's okay. And we want to give them that sense of security and that sense of validation and community. And okay, sometimes I get a little bit um, prejudicial about neurotypicals. Oh, go um, ahead, go on. You're in a safe space. I, 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 I find sometimes that, that, you know, people who, who don't, experience trouble so much in their lives or who, who don't experience feeling different or feeling outcast, they, they don't necessarily understand that need for having that community. And I think because, because we have gone through that, that being different and that need to, to understand why we're different, um we we want to give them that or we we think about it more i don't know that's, that's interesting but we're we're getting so much off topic guys though oh, wow <laughs> <tangents>. on topic sort of wow still... tangents happen yeah actually it, it, just to, just to, i want to emphasize something that you've just said um from a personal experience is that although i was diagnosed later in life I have been different all my life. And, mm -hmm. and like, I was really aware when I was like in grade one, I, so in grade one, um, I drew a map of Australia from memory to celebrate Captain Cook's discovery of Australia 200 years previously. Um, and evidently, like it was in the newspaper and a you know, member of parliament came to give me a reward. And I just, wow. just drew this map. Now, I don't think I'm very artistic. I don't know where that came from. So blah, blah, blah. Um, but then I, 
I'm supremely good at soccer and was playing professional soccer at a ridiculously young age. And I went to a music class, a mandatory music class in grade eight and fundamentally started teaching myself piano. And two years later, I was a professional musician. And two years later, I'm traveling the world playing music. Like I recognize that's not everybody. Yeah. So all my life, I've known I've been different and never felt, I've really never felt being part of anything because I mm -hmm. just, all my interests sort of zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the teaching philosophies for me is to, to be really open to anybody I teach about me and going, I am really different. I understand that. And that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's okay. I, think that's amazing. I have to say, I feel like for me, I, you know, talking about sharing diagnosis and whether or not to, it's, it, it's almost not a choice. Cause it's like, this is, this is a part of who I am. If I don't say it, am I being authentic to myself? Like, it, it, I, I think that, am that I lying? <laughs> right. That autistic tendency for truth telling. And this is where it gets murky for me because mm -hmm. around the time I got my diagnosis, I was recently single after a very long relationship. And it was like, do I now have to tell people I'm dating right off the bat? And as it turns out, I decided not to tell people right off the bat. <laughs> like, um, sorry, person I'm dating now. Uh, <laughs> You're going to find out soon when you hear my podcast. No, um, I'll say something before. But otherwise, like there are certainly situations <laughs> where I've thought about like this could be a disadvantage. Like if I want to, let's say, become a superintendent in a school board, are mm -hmm. they going to deny that to me because they look at my Twitter and see my well, intensive autistic advocacy? Um, this is really an aspect of late diagnosis that that I find important, which is like, when you seek a diagnosis, how public do you want to be with it? Is it going to af affect your career? Um, are people going to look at you differently? And, and is it going to affect your opportunities? Like I had people in, in, in university while I was studying psychology being like, but how can you be a psychologist if you're autistic? And, and for me, this is, this is just my personal choice. And, and obviously it's, it's yours too, on some level. Um, for me, it's like, well, if I'm not going to be public about this, then no one is ever going to know yes. that we are here and that we are doing these jobs and that we're good at them. Mm -hmm. And like one of the psychologists that I look up to the most is autistic and is public about it. And that is so inspiring to me, but like, I know that in certain um, careers, this can have a significant impact mm -hmm. and you might want to keep it secret. Mm -hmm. So Bruce, for you, what made you say, I'm going to be public about this? I, um, one, I am almost physically incapable of lying. It, it, it actually does cause, you know, physical pain. Um, neurotribes, I think, reading the stories of neurotribes, I, I knew straight away that I'd have to be, I wanted to be as public as possible because mm -hmm. I wanted to show people that we exist. And it's like, it's suddenly, you know, the day before I was diagnosis, I'm not autistic. The day after I am autistic, I've always existed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you've always been autistic. Yeah. You yeah. just didn't know. And, and, and um, I have said in, actually I've said in interviews before, my life is quite didactic. Um, and so part of that teaching is being an example and i don't when i'm talking like this i can i i intellectually go yes bruce you're being an example when i'm doing it i don't think of it you know i'm you know being mm -hmm. an example and showing people how to do things but that's the feeling um mm -hmm. there's nothing to be ashamed of um and if it does affect your career you need to fight that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saying yeah, and, that, and, and we are in every career, everywhere. We are. We are. I also acknowledge. I mean, this is part of my my job now. Is I mean, in fact, I I will get 
two or three clients a week asking about being public. And mm -hmm. it's always, yeah. And, and Maya, you said that you said the, the most important thing, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always your choice. You can be completely your choice. I always encourage them not to be frightened or afraid, but also mm -hmm. you have to judge. Um, and you have to judge, but then also see how ableist that process will be. And like, mm -hmm. perhaps it's like, you want to say nothing about now, that's completely fine. Maybe five years down the road, you can help change things by, by doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, look, I, I lost a job, lost a job quite horribly two years ago, fundamentally because I'm autistic mm -hmm. and it was traumatic and it's still, it still hurts a lot, but it's like, it's better to have done that than to be continuing and, and to be masking and be hiding at all. Yeah. Much yeah. better. Absolutely. Um, can I just say also like self-diagnosis is completely valid and that's, that's oh, usually course. how, that's usually how we start. Right. Um, for those of us who pursue it on our own. Um, yeah. For, but, for late diagnoses, for, for adult diagnoses, there is that process of thinking, oh, I might be autistic. I think I'm autistic. And oh, I seeking... relate to everybody on autistic Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and then like, then you figure out, do I have the resources? Am I in a position where it's possible for me to seek out an official diagnosis? And do I even want to? And actually, um, related to that, Bruce, um, do you have any, any advice for people who as adults are getting ready for their official assessment? Uh, is there anything about like what to expect or getting ready for it? Is there anything that crosses? Actually, your mind? yeah. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to take the academic intellectual response to this, but go for the more feeling thing. Just be truthful. Yeah. Like there's nothing to be scared of. And to be completely honest, I think actually the, probably the, the most difficult thing is being honest in the way that we tend to mask so much mm -hmm. and we try and give the answer that we think somebody's looking for. So it's that just go in and, and, and be completely honest with yourself and be honest with the, with the, the diagnostician, be honest with the, diagno the, the, the questions, all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, that, that process is going to probably tell you a lot about mm -hmm. how autistic you, 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 you feel, actually. Yeah, yeah and, and, and another thing from, from a psychologist's point of view, um, of course, it matters who you're working with through your, your diagnosis, uh, through your assessment. But I would like to say that it's okay to ask questions about the questions. So if you don't understand a question, you don't understand how to interpret the language of a question, it's okay to ask. And sometimes the way you think it should be interpreted isn't how it should actually be interpreted. And a lot of people who get their diagnosis late in life, um, as adults even, they've been masking for so long, they don't know they're masking. Yeah. And that comes through sometimes in the way we answer questions. Mm -hmm. That was actually my point about being honest yeah. may teach you like yeah. how much that you go, or, you know, how do you feel? I'm feeling yeah. great. No, actually I'm not. No. And if you tell somebody that it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hiding that. That's the yeah. easy one. Yeah. Um, I would love, and this may be a, this, a suggestion for you, for, for you guys. Uh, by the way, these guys in this kind of weirdly Australian yeah, that's, way, which just, that's... just means people. Um, I would love to hear a teenager, 16 to 18, who's just been diagnosed and whether they had self-diagnosed earlier. Interesting. Yeah, mm. that's a good question. Because I think, I think Maya, for you, obviously you didn't self-diagnose at 16. I, I, no. from, from your story, mm. just like there was no, it was actually impossible. It'd be interesting where the world's a lot more open about autism, whether mm -hmm. there are now teenagers who think, yes, you know what, I think I'm diagnosed, I am autistic because this, this, and this. 
Mm-hmm. And then what happens after the process? Mm-hmm. Cara, are you drinking a martini? No, it's water out of a martini glass. I just thought it was ah, a really fun glass, and I was okay. like, I'm going to put it in. Um, I want to I want to share how I prepared. Um, so obviously, I had lots of conversations with Bruce and other. I have like I have many autistic friends, which maybe should have been a clue to. Um, <laughs> and, and then and, and you teach specially e speech. I, and I've had students ask me for years, how do you mm-hmm. understand us so well if you're not autistic? Oh, ding, ding, ding. Um, so I have for years, I have actually been tracking on my phone. Like I'll just put down like quirks of my, my, my own quirks. I, so I have a list. And then as I started engaging more with autistic Twitter, ADHD Twitter, I would like be like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I hard relate to that. Write that down, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so part of my preparation, like, and I need to prepare, I need to sort of feel like I know what I'm going into. Uh, I charted it all. And it was like a 21 page document <laughs> with traits over time. Like, it, and they right away, they were like, you're not neurotypical. Um, but that's I, probably actually very helpful for it, a diagnostician to, to have that because oh, yeah? you're going to get all of those details all written down pages. beforehand, things that you would forget to say mm-hmm. during mm. the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, again, because of processing time and the way that our memory works, yeah. you know, you would forget probably 80% of those 21 yeah. pages. Yeah, exactly. And, and then they would never know. And, and, and also I was really emotional, even though I was prepared. Like once I charted it, I was like, oh, okay. You don't even need to tell me. Like, but, um, but I did find it very emotional and it was several sessions and I actually, so at first it was a therapist who did like a screener and then it was, um, the, the person who did the actual diagnosis, who was a doctor and both times, almost immediately off the bat, I started to cry. It was just like pent up emotions and anxiety, right. About what would happen. Um, but I, I also was very lucky because I found a, a clinic where all of the practitioners are neurodivergent. So I also felt like there was some relief that, that they would understand me and they wouldn't just go, wait, you can't possibly be, you have a PhD, you have a job, like, you know, um, I knew that I wouldn't have that experience, hopefully of, of being dismissed. Um, but yeah, the emotional response was pretty intense. And uh, um, so I think like being prepared for that and, and it's okay to be emotional too, I think in that circumstance. Um, I yeah, think- so realizing that you you might actually have some unexpected reactions to, to being there and confronting it. And yeah. saying it out loud to someone you don't yeah. know, right? Yeah. Well, it's very different when, than me texting When you texting say things Bruce. out loud, then, then it's true. Yeah. Or it uh, becomes more real somehow. Yeah. 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 And it, like- it's funny how the, the, the system, like the three of us have had different experience in the, in this, in the system, which again is problematic because it means there's so much, it's still so subjective. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is. Of course it is. Well, especially when the criteria is designed for little white boys, mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, different cultures need to have their own, ways of figuring but, but I think it out. that's I think that's one of the really good reasons actually to prepare notes for when yes. you're going in because gathering information knowing what to say um knowing experiences to highlight examples of I do this um and, oh, and, and being able people. to yeah um and and having all of that before you go into the assessment because a good psychologist and a good psychiatrist are going to recognize things that things that point in the direction of autism but that aren't explicitly in the diagnostic criteria and and they can walk that line and that's where that's where some people are maybe a little bit too stringent with the diagnostic criteria and and end up actually (laughs) leaving some people without a diagnosis that should have had definitely, one. Definitely. I mean, it's funny, like, Cara, uh, walking into a diagnosis with a 21-page itemized list, <laughs> I would just sort of go... Check, tick, check, tick. check. <laughs> now, which, which of the ticks is the one that gives, gives us the most points? I mean, is it ADHD? <laughs> is it autism? Oh, it's a kind of both. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. you. Look, honestly, it's a five-minute diagnosis. 
Um, um, <laughs> but then it's also, sorry, to, um, I, I think when we're talking about this, we also have to recognize how many, and it's almost always women, who walk in and they look at the, the doctor in the eyes and it's instantly, right, you're not autistic, goodbye. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, and ow. We are more and more recognizing how much masking is a thing. Yeah. Um, and not just for autistic women, but for autistic people, because I, I also think it's important that we recognize there are a lot of men who don't get a diagnosis because they're masking. And we, for the last 15 years, I want to say, we've been associating masking with women. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that there are a lot of people, <laughs> regardless yes. of gender, who mask and we don't want any of them to, to lose their opportunity to get a diagnosis that they qualify for and that would help them because they mask and, and their gender isn't what we associate with the symptom of masking. Yes. So, Good point. Sorry, that, that's a pet peeve of mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get political. No, you're um, right. I, I have a friend who I'm sure, I'm sure is one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they had asked about a diagnosis at some point and the mm -hmm. psychiatrist said like, no, you, you're like a creative, they're in the crea creative field. So, so I'm not going to say exactly what they do, but um, they, the mm -hmm. therapist had seen their body of work or some, some representation of their work and said, there's no way you could be autistic and have produced something like this. Oh. And uh, it's just like, no, you absolutely can yeah. create, whether you're a writer, you're a musician, you're like, you can create beautiful emotional of, work. Yeah. And there are a lot of autistic people in creative fields, mm -hmm. in all creative fields. Like we're there. <laughs> And like, we're all actors. Come on. We should all get Oscars. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's what Maybe I said us, in, but... in that, um, in that old, old video, which I probably should make it public again, but like, yeah, we spend every day, all day pretending to be neurotypical. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think we are on to the thing of the day. And I think Bruce, you had, you had brought something with you. How, how it's show and tell time. And how interesting, because because I um we've moved straight into it. So so I want to talk about this book. Um rec can you see it or am yeah. I screen blurring? Yeah. Okay. It's a little blurry, but we can see the title. Yeah. Okay, it's recognizing uh, it's gone. Recognizing autism in women and girls, um, when it has been hidden well, um, by Wendala Whitcomb Marsh. Um, just a book that's been published this year. It's been on my um, my Amazon list has been you know coming soon and uh, I got it last week and read the, for somebody who works in the field which I think counts the three of us this is only an hour hour and a half free um, I think the most important thing I want to say about it which is disappointing is this book is written for therapists mm. it's to help them. To, to discover if somebody is masking a diagnosis process, I found that, that so much of it was so basic. And it's like, do you really not knowing about this? And then I, I've been thinking about it as I was sort of preparing for the podcast, like that's mm -hmm. maybe a little unfair because we are subject domain experts. Yeah. And so it's it's always going to be, oh, can't don't you recognize this? Don't you see this? And it's like, well, yeah. okay, maybe not. Anyway, so the book is, it takes seven um case studies of um, of women, mm -hmm. and then goes through in each chapter, uh, sections of the DSM-5 and shows how those, um, the case study people react and, and how they um, go through and it ticks this, these boxes. And, mm -hmm. and it's a case study. So, you know, they tick all the boxes and all that sort of stuff, but it's still, mm -hmm. it's still pretty cool. The best thing though, is at the end of every chapter, um, there's questions for the therapist to, to look at. Um, let me just let me just have a look. So here's one about behind the mask. Here's and and so just some questions like, 
ask the, the person when you're overwhelmed, other ways you move your body like rocking or pacing that helps you self-regulate or express that feeling. Are there subtle things you do at these times that often others don't notice, like squeezing your arms or clenching your jaw? So at the end of a chapter, there's questions that a therapist can ask um, to, to, to sort of see, are they, are they masking? Now, what I like about this is that this is also really good for allies, mm -hmm. somebody, um, parents. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably good for people who are self-diagnosing also just to look at the, the masking yeah. aspect. Well, even I, to ask other people, like there's a lot about myself. I'm not aware that I do necessarily like, yeah. so asking, you know, asking a partner, um, what are some areas you think I'm rigid about? Mm -hmm. Or I was driving with a friend recently and she said, oh, you do this really cute thing where you hum and you do something with your hand. And I have no idea that I do this. Like, uh, so I'm like, that's a stim. I didn't know that I have, but she was like, yeah, you do it. I've seen you do it a few times, <laughs> you know, that's helpful framing. It is. Yeah. And, and there are actually, this is, this is something that I see a lot. And, and this is part of why uh, in the diagnostic assessment process, we prefer to have um, parents or other family members come in and actually um, do a, a session as well about the person. And this is because one, there are going to be things in childhood that you don't remember, but also other people see things you do that you don't notice. So it's, it, it, it can feel probably a little bit uh, overwhelming or invasive to have other people go and talk to a diagnostician about you very often without you present, um, that, that can probably feel very invasive. Um, but it's, there's a reason we do it. I, I am, um, Meredith was certainly very much part of my diagnosis process. Mm -hmm. And I've learned really quickly, I've known for years that if I go see a doctor, I will forget to tell something or, or, or not say something that's not important, that in fact is the most important thing. So mm -hmm. I've, I'm like, anything to do about me meredith can can answer questions i'm completely an open book and trust her implicitly um i wish everybody in the world had their own meredith mm -hmm. because i know that's a it's a, it's kind of also was a rare thing and so I, and you, my point your point is exactly right you you need for the for a an official medical diagnosis or official diagnosis mm -hmm. you do need an external validation well yeah. it's it's someone else's experiences of you that can put some things into perspective mm -hmm. is is really all it is but you know what this actually makes me think of a question go for, for it for today <laughs> so as autistic people what are the the traits of the people in your life that make you feel the best, the safest, what are the traits of those people that make life good and healthy? What are we looking for? For me, I, one of them is someone who understands my need for space, that it is not a personal thing. If I need space, someone I can pick up with when I have the energy, and who feels comfortable doing the same with me. Um, someone I can just be silent with uh, and also talk with, but like, I really enjoy that parallel play Bruce talked about. Um, so that's definitely one of the things. And I think just in general, curiosity and love of learning. Like I like, mm -hmm. I like to deep dive with people much like we do on this podcast. Um, so I like someone who can follow me down rabbit holes and can introduce me to new rabbit holes. Those would be two of the things. For me, it's trust. Mm. Like uh, I, I need somebody to tell me exactly what they are thinking or what's going on. If I've missed it, I, I, I know I have missed uh, social cues all the yeah. time, but 50 years, I know. I, I, and so um, it, especially in a domestic situation, like I want Meredith to tell me, mm -hmm. look, this is annoying or you did this. Um, 
she'll kick me under the table and I will say, why did you kick me under the table? And then it's like, oh, I've done something. I've missed something. And it's like, and, and, and with all our, we don't have a huge circle of friends, but you know, I'm also very, I'm making fun of myself because I, I'm, I know, look, I've missed something and I'm going to miss something and I apologize, but like, what did I miss? Yeah. You know, that, that's, <laughs> so it, it, yeah. all the things that Kara said, but for me, it's the trust. Yeah. Um, and, and it, the, it hurts. The honesty. Yeah. And it hurts sometimes, but it's also, that's okay. Oh, and people who, here's another one that you made me think of. When you ask them how they are, they'll, they'll actually tell you how they are. That like, yeah. even if, even if it takes five minutes to be like, I'm having a horrible day and all of these things happen and I'm really stressed out. I, I, I prefer, and I also expect people to be fairly direct with me. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I like inherently trust people, which can be a problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that that is a marker for me that the, this is someone I can trust when they when they are yeah. wear their heart on their sleeves, to use a saying. Yeah, Maya. For, for me, I think the most important. Um, I, I I think the top of the list is honesty. After that comes. Um, a willingness and an ability to grow, to listen and to grow as a person. And then I find the people I do best with are people who are either very emotionally stable um, or people who are aware that they are emotionally unstable and willing to like talk about it and, mm. and recognize it. Um, so my, my husband is, is one of those people that doesn't have a lot of emotional um, ups and downs. He's, he, he's not flatline, you know, he, <laughs> he does have emotions, but he, it, it, they're not big emotions. And I think he finds my range of emotions kind of amusing because, oh, well, um, but it helps me that he doesn't follow me on those ups and downs. He can kind of stay in the middle. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is a, one of my absolutely best friends and longest friends um, is, is, is someone who is very, very emotional and who can have big emotional outbursts over fairly small things but we can talk about it after. And, you know, it's someone who, who is willing to have that conversation and be like, okay, I was unreasonable there, or I felt this way and that's why I reacted like that. And now I'm past it. And, and I think if I was to say like, other than the honesty and, and the willingness to listen and grow, those would be, like if you're if you're going to be highly emotional, be able to talk about it, and, and if you're not, yeah. yeah. And if you're not going to be an emotional person, then accept that that some of us are. That's mm -hmm. almost honesty, though, as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So many of these things relate to honesty. Yeah. <laughs> honesty and like acceptance of differences in mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I, that's. That's an interesting. Uh, I've said many, many, many times that I could never go out with somebody who was politically conservative, and that's a that's a pure re reaction of kind of my belief system. Mm -hmm. But it's the it's the acceptance that I think is the most important thing, and I think that you've you've just because you've articulated it, sort of made this this point that. Um, like how important that is. Yeah. It, I, I, I have three children, uh, one who I don't speak to very much anymore. And I, um, I'm, I, I wish that they would contact me sometimes now that we live in the same city. Um, but they came out, they said to his mother and I that um, they were gay at like seven. And then when they were 12 or 13, they said, um, I, I, I want to, they were born female. I want to, to be treated as, as, a, as a man now. Mm 
Okay, fine. And honestly, for both of us as parents, it was nothing. And in fact, at this time, I had separated from his mother and I was with, with Meredith, who uh, whose mother is gay. Um, Meredith was the first person in Alberta to get uh, um, orphan's rights because her mother's female partner died and, she, and like in the early 90s was suddenly recognition of, of gay marriage in Alberta well before it was legal. Yeah. Um, both my kids now are gender fluid and it's just like you can't be you can't be non-accepting around our family just because because mm -hmm. it just it just wouldn't exact but it's but that's a that's something that I've attracted mm -hmm. like it's a person like that. We look for in other people all the things that we've always wished we'd had, right? That acceptance, that honesty. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are those are the good people to look for and to hang on to. And then, of course, the important part is to be honest and accepting back. Okay. So, yeah. being willing to talk about who you are and what your support needs are and for example in a relationship and and I know definitely we're going to do a podcast episode on this at some point is is relationships but um so my my husband and I we started dating when he was just turning 17 and I was 19 and as teens <laughs> we already were having that conversation about um, okay, I've, I've been social all day. I need a bit of time to myself now to recharge. And all of our friends were like, but, but don't you text every day? And we were like, no, 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 no. We see each other like once a week. And like, just being able to have that conversation and accepting that, that, you know, we do have different needs as people and that's all okay. And explaining the reasons behind it mm -hmm. I think I think that communication that willingness to communicate is key to then keeping those good people around mm -hmm. absolutely such good words I wish I listened to them myself I'm terrible at asking for what I need like but that's where I'm growing but we can practice and you have a Meredith so. I do have a Meredith who, who, who drags it out of me. Because <laughs> she knows you so well. Yeah. And cheers to those people. Mm -hmm. All you right. Know. I think that's where we should wrap this up. Bruce, thanks for being here. This will not be the last time. We've got lots of rabbit holes to go down together. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. We'll do more. And I... we, we, we hardly even talked about the, the post-diagnosis aspect. Anyway. <laughs> It'll be another episode, maybe. Maybe it'll be a tangent on another episode. <laughs> so thanks sorry, for sticking with us. No, I mean, that's that's what we do. <laughs> no, I feel like we covered a lot of ground today. And I feel like the tangents we did, uh, we did have today were constructive and fun. So always constructive. <laughs> So I guess all that's left for today is just to say thank you to the audience and we hope you enjoyed our tangents today and we hope you'll join us another time. Thank you. Artistic tidbits of taste.